Hello, and welcome to this very special 100th episode of A Mic on the Podium with me, Michael Seal. This episode has been sponsored by Christian Ernie, who is a conductor and the founder of the Zurich Chamber Singers. Christian also subscribes to my Patreon page, and his subscription means that he could choose an episode to sponsor, and it comes as no surprise that he chose this episode. More about my Patreon page later, but now let's crack on with episode 100. Today, I conduct a conversation with an English conductor who's had a 60-year career, starting when he founded the Schutz Choir in 1962. He also founded the London Classical Players in 1978, and over his career, he's held title positions in the UK, the US, Austria, Switzerland and Germany. On November 18th, 2021, he retired from conducting with a concert of music purely by Joseph Haydn. It's a very great pleasure to welcome Sir Roger Norrington. Roger, it is a very great pleasure to welcome you to the podcast, to say hi and to meet you for the first time. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. Good. Uh, There speaks the man who, before I press record, said he was very happy in his retirement. And so uh, I'm sure we'll come to that later on. If if you don't mind, I'm going to go right back to the beginning. Um, I know that you were a violinist and a singer. Did you come from a a musical family? Was music all around you when you were a child and how did the music start for you playing the violin etc I I came from a musical family entirely amateur Mm. musical family my father and mother both sang in the Oxford Bach choir oh wow we were born in Oxford and and um they I think they met actually singing in a in a Gilbert and Sullivan uh, Christmas (laughs) operetta Hmm. performing in a private house somewhere. So their music was important to them, but um, absolutely no professional back- background. My my granny, my mother's mother, was at the Royal College of Music in 1890 with Ray Fawn Williams. But, wow. um, and I've got a few scores of hers, but um, not unfortunately her violin. But um, yeah, we, 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 my sister played the piano a bit, my mother played the piano, my father sang, my brother played the cello a bit. Um, I played the violin, but uh, we were all just amateurs, and there wasn't a lot of music around. I mean, I mean, uh, there was no, there was no uh, Radio Three in those days. Mm. Um, I had very, very few gramophone records. I mean, I remember being given Beethoven Five and Six with Toscanini, but that was about all I had really. <laughs> um, and uh, we 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 tended to make the music. You know, we sang, we sang um, madrigals in, in the family with a few friends, and we. Occasionally played. I played a quartet with the other friends, but it was very amateurish, and I stayed that way for a long time. Mm. And why the violin? Was it uh, something you'd seen in a concert or something, and decided you wanted to have a go yeah. at? Or that's a good. That's a good question. No, the answer is um, in, in in an ordinary class of uh, whatever the class was at the time. Uh, somebody came into the room and said, "Excuse me, I have two people." Two people can learn can learn the violin next term, and I found I just found my hand in the air. <laughs> that, that was how I decided on the violin. If it had been the oboe, I'd have been an oboist. If it had been the bass, <laughs> it was just it was the op- my my instinct immediately to, to, was to, to learn an instrument, even though I knew this was, I was nine at the time, I think eight or nine, mm. and I just uh, I just grabbed it, and um, in, in a way in a way my whole um, background is that is that instinctive, entirely amateur in the, in the best sense of the word. Yes. Um, attitude. Um, just, just. I had no plans to be a musician at all, hmm. and I didn't become one until I was twenty-eight. Yes. Well, I mean, I read that you you went to Clare College, Cambridge, and studied English literature. So, I mean, immediately there, it's telling me that you didn't see your future being in music by going and studying English literature. Around this time or up to the point you go to Cambridge, did you play in orchestras as a child, youth orchestras? I mean, I, you know, things like that. Um, no, no, youth, no youth orchestras. I don't think I was good enough for, okay. for the NRL, for instance. Um, I just played in orchestra at school, Yeah. Um, of course, uh, a bit, and, and in choir. So that was, I learned a bit about playing orchestras there. Don't cross your legs. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, play in time and so on. But no, I had no, 
uh, no no uh, semi-professional work like NYO, for instance. Mm. When I went up to Cambridge, I was surrounded by these very capable people. A lot of them scientists who were incredibly good uh, at playing instruments. A lot of them didn't become musicians at all. Um, uh, my friend Peter Renshaw was led, led a string quartet, which I played in for three years with him, two others. And um, he, he later stopped stopped being a musician and I started being a musician. He's right. been in education ever since and I've been in music uh, eventually ever since. But you, you went to Cambridge as a choral scholar, if I remember correctly, which yes. means that you were singing by now yes. to yes. a pretty high standard. Yeah, I was, I was, I was keen to sing. Yeah, but I hadn't really had any training, but, but I, I, I had a good natural tenor voice. And um, yeah, I, I, I went up to the singing tests one, I think it was sort of March one year. I remember singing in, in a very dark King's Chapel, but, but, you know, but sing, singer after singer huh. um, sang away, and I did too. And um, and I was, was my first taste of stardom really because I wanted to go to Clare. I didn't actually want to be a you know full time singer like you are at King's or or John's huh. and all other colleges now Trinity, but um, but I was actually. I was actually headhunted by both Kings and Johns. They said, would you like to think about joining our choir? And I said, well, thank you very much, but I, I'd like to go to Clare if I may. So mm. I was obviously quite good, um, but entirely amateurish, but I, I would, that would have been a different, a different line of country. Yeah. Um, but I did tons of music at Cambridge. I mean, it really, I got a pretty poor degree in English, but I enjoyed it, the English very much, but I did a lot of very high class music, singing and playing. And eventually conducting my first my first concert was in Clare College Chapel um, with with friends that I that I had at that time. So it was a very formative musical time, Cambridge. Mm. So we've got as far as Cambridge before we've mentioned the word conducting. Um, why yeah. did you want to conduct? Um, and what can you remember what the program was on your first concert? Yes, I can. It was um, uh, uh, Bach and Handel. Uh, it was just a small 12 singers and 12 players, tiny group. Mm. Um, uh, Bach, Jesu Mana Freud, I think, for the, for the, for the choir, and um, alone, uh, with a continuer, and um, a, a handle, uh, uh, Concerto Grosso, those marvellous pieces. Mm. Um, and then after the interval, a Bach cantata, number 21, Ich hatte viel bekümmernis. Um, and uh, it was it was very exciting. It was very very lovely. What made me want to conduct? I, I'd, i I suppose like 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 all of us conductors, we naturally bossy, um, wanting to be in charge, but mostly having a lot to say about the music. I felt I had a lot. Look, when I was in the quartet, I was constantly making suggestions. When I was singing with a group, I would be making suggestions. I like to be well led by good conductors, but. But I, I had tons of ideas about how it, how it would go. And so I wanted to try that out. Mm. Um, and I, I must say it was, it was quite successful, that, that first concert. I mean, I met people who'd been playing or singing you know, in, the, in the following days. And they said, when's the next one? When's the next one? I'll sing for you anywhere. You know, mm. so it was, it was very flattering. Um, so I have obviously had some sort of, some sort of feeling for it. Mm. Well, the chronology of the next portion of your life uh, I'm not sure I know, but I know that you were um, a professional tenor, but I also know that you went to the Royal College of Music and studied conducting with Sir Adrian Bolt. Were the two things running alongside each other? Yes. I mean, yeah. after Cambridge, I went to into into publishing. Hmm. I went to, I, I didn't have any idea about being a musician. I, I was going to do lots of amateur music, which I did in London, as I had in Cambridge. I played in little orchestras, I played in quartets. I sang in a lot of, lot of groups. Um, I played for the Chelsea Opera Group and, um, and sang for the Chelsea Opera Group and was on the committee of the Chelsea Opera Group under Colin Davis. Um, uh, but I was an amateur from sort of four or five years until, until I was 28. When I was 28, I decided I, I wanted to do music in the daytime as well as in the evenings. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, and I, I was actually, I was sent to Africa by my by my firm for about four 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 months or so. Yeah. In 1962, and 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 while I was there, of course, I didn't have a 
any of that music at all. Oh. And um, I was getting more and more desperate without it. Um, but when I came back, it was on my way back, I decided I'd got to try to be a professional. So I really didn't know how to do how to do it, how to be a professional. So I, I came back, left my job and had no work. I was a freelance freelance tenor. Yeah. I was no work. So it was it was it's a pretty low start, 1962. But I had just before that, in the spring of 62, before I went to Africa, I, I had uh, founded the Schutz Choir. Yes. So an amateur, an amateur choir, we gave a very successful first Schutz concert in St. Bartholomew the Great. It's surprisingly successful. I mean, amazing reviews from, from um, and this sort of unknown composer. Um, all, all Schutz. Oh, all wow. Schutz. Um, of course, he, he was a fantastic composer, and for 10 years, I had a Schutz choir. Wonder, wonderful time. Um, so, and it was at that moment when I came back from Africa that I went to the Royal College of Music at the age of 28 to kind of legitimize my activity, as it were. Went by, yeah. Where did you study? I didn't study. Where did mm. you study? At the Royal College of Music. Yeah. So I, I felt it kind of legitimized a bit. Um, I, I did piano and history and and, 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 and Adrian, yes, conducting. Um, the the Keith, Keith Faulkner, the, the, the principal at that time, was uh, incredibly helpful actually because um, I, I went to see him and said, you know, could I, in any chance I could study here? What would I have to do? And he said, yes, I've heard about you. You, you did a, something with your choir, didn't you? And you've done something here with your choir. And he said, he said you, you're 28, you know what you want. He said, you come here, you don't have to take any exams. You don't, you can do exactly what you want to do. If we haven't got room for you here, we're doing the wrong job. Yes. And that was an incredibly, incredibly um, helpful because it's exactly what I needed and wanted. Um, and so I, I actually got most of my lessons there in, on the same day. So I was sort of going to college once or, or, or on the day when Adrian conducted the orchestra and had my had sort of four or five different classes and then and then went back and, and, and pursued my career <laughs> as a as a, an unknown tenor. Yes. But as a tenor, you could, the great thing is as a tenor, you could do auditions. Yes. The problem with the conductor is you can't do auditions. You can only do those ghastly competitions, which I've never done. Um, so I could get I could get work as a tenor. And so for about another four years or so, I did all the, you know, creation in King's Lynn and and um, Rossini Starbet Marta in Glasgow. And, you know, every, every most Saturdays I was out making ten guineas <laughs> um, <laughs> plus train fare. Um, and um, so I, I learned all about that side of it. Um, and with all the amateur conductors that one met, it made one even more wish to be a good mm. conductor. Um, in the Philharmonia Chorus, uh, with a wonderful chorus master, Wilhelm Pitts, who was the chorus master at Bayreuth at that time as well. He flew over once a week, and that was under, under Klemperer, of course, and Giulini. Mm. So I learned a lot from them and from Pitts, indeed. So I was learning, learning, and, um, and, and studying, and, and working. So, so what did you learn from Sir Adrian Bolt? Yes. Um, in a way, not an awful lot. Oh, really? But he, tied, he, tied, he tidied me up. I mean, yeah. the class wasn't very, wasn't really for professional conductors. It was really more for people who were going to be in charge of, of the music at Cambridge or Oxford, oh. or um, organists who were going to be uh, cathedral organists. It's that kind of, that kind of gen gentlemanly conducting, you might say. Yes. And and both. And Bolt, although he was, very, he was very kind and very nice, and I knew him a little bit from before, um, he uh, he he wasn't the sort of conductor I wanted to be. Really, you know, he was very mm. stern, stiff, Edwardian, um, unexciting. You know, I I I liked I liked Giulini and Colin Davis, and you know, I liked a bit of action. Mm. So I didn't learn a lot from him, but we, I learned about scores and. And he tidied up my, my amateur technique a little bit. And also the class did. You know, the class would say, you look funny doing that. Why don't you do that? Mm. Um, but it, it was, I didn't learn an awful lot, but it, 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 it made me concentrate on what was needed. Yeah. Mm. Well, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it, is that, you know, you'd, 
you know, I, I had various violin teachers and I've had various conducting teachers and you sort of take the things that you want to take from them. Um, you know, I remember, especially as a violinist, my teacher was five foot one with tiny hands and I'm six foot with massive shovels of hands. You know, certain <laughs> things were never going to work for me. Um, and yeah, and I'm exactly the same as conducting. You know, you, you sometimes you need tidying up, but you've always got your own gestures or your own way of doing things and you can't always be a clone of somebody. Um, no, but, no, no. No, I, I mean, I, I suppose I wanted to be like Giulini or Colin Davis. They were, they were sort of, um, sort of models. That's the first book wasn't. But mm. um, and I, I, you do, you do, you do learn a lot from watching people sing, sing playing in an orchestra, um, particularly singing in a choir because you've got more, 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 more time to watch. Yes. Um, and and uh, there, there are people one wanted to be like, and one tried to see how they did it. Mm. And in fact. I remember thinking that I learned more from people's mistakes or the people who weren't so good um, as the people who are, because the people who are very, very good, you think, how the hell did he do that? You know, <laughs> how, I can't understand it. It's just amazing, it's so simple. Yeah. Um, and, um, and the bad people think, oh, won't do that again, or needs more, a bigger upbeat, or too much left hand, or, you know, well, I was really, really studying um, while, while singing and playing for all these different people. Yes. And um, but I have my own way of doing things, and I haven't got a fancy technique. Um, in fact, you don't need a fancy technique, do you? No. Um, you just need something that's clear and that's authoritative and that's and that's appealing. Yes. It wants to, it wants to look wants to look reasonably attractive. It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't want to look stupid. It to look stupid. Uh, so, and I've learned more subsequently from teaching conducting than I, than I did from learning, I think. Yes. Because you, you suddenly realize what you know and you, and, you, and you bring it out and you help people. Yeah. Before we leave singing, um, I have a question which, uh, the, the, probably was going to lead into historically informed performance and you know what you're you're best known for but as a tenor I wonder whether um you most of the work that you were interested in doing and especially things like Schutz and whatever else but even singing solo was it was in a specific area of classical music i.e baroque and therefore as a tenor you were vibrating less than say somebody who's singing Puccini or Wagner at that time. You know, how, how did you sing as a tenor compared to how your ethos as a conductor? Is that a, is that a clear enough question, Roger? It's a very, it's a very clear question. It's a, it's a good question. And the answer is at that stage, I had no, no concept of, of, uh, of less vibrato, of pure tone mm. whatsoever. Yeah. Um, I thought that Peter Pears was a wonderful singer, mm. despite that massive vibrato. And in fact, he was a wonderful singer with incredible intensity. And I knew him quite well. I did a lot of work with him later on. But um, not as a singer, I mean. Um, but as a, as a singer, yeah, I sang, yeah, um, I mean, things like Matthew Passion in the Festival Hall, you know, The Evangelist. Yeah. Um, in various parts of the country. Quite good at that, I was. The, the, the drama and the, 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 speak, the spoken la language. Um, I sang Cosi Fan Tutte um, with Menuhin conducting. At the Bath Festival. That was uh, that was his his first and probably only opera uh, uh, outing, and he was pretty bad at it. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> he had his head buried in the score. We never saw his eyes, yeah. um, he, he, and he really hadn't got a clue how to, how to do it. But but it was but it was exciting. Yes. Um, you know, those are the kind of things. Oh, I sang in. See, but on the other hand, modern you know, quite a lot of modern stuff. Um, I sang in the premiere of Nicholas Moore's first opera, mm. One Man Show, at the Janetta Cochrane Theatre. Um, and um, oh, we sang in quite a few television operas, uh, four, I think, so, as a soloist, I mean. Yeah. Monsieur, Monsieur Triquet in, in, in uh, Anyegin, for instance, um, dressed as rather an ancient fellow when I was only about 32. Um, but yeah, so it was Baroque, classical, Britain, uh, modern, but not uh, not of course the heavy the heavy. Uh, no. uh, I was, I was a, a light English tenor, like 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 Philip Langridge was, or or or, um, or, or all these all these guys. Um, can't think yeah. of any names at all at the moment, but yeah, in, in, typical English tenor. 
with quite a, quite a lot of wobble. I mean, I was trying, <laughs> I was trying to trying to do the wobble. I think naturally I wouldn't have had any, but if that's what people did, you know, everybody learned to wobble, like like we did on the violin. Mm, mm. Um, I had to unlearn it later. Yes. And I never sang. I never sang consciously without vibrato at all ever as a singer. Because when I well, by the time I stopped. Um, I was still expecting vibrato from orchestras. I mean, it only came with old instruments. Yes. Yeah. So when did you stop? I mean, you become music director of Kent Opera in 1969. So I'm assuming that, you know, around then you were, you'd were stopped oh, it was, singing? It was before that, I think, really. Probably, yeah. 63, four, probably I stopped in 65, 66, I should think. Yeah. Um, it just became impossible. I mean, you, 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 you're you shouting at a big choir and orchestra uh, one evening and the next minute, next evening I tried to sing and it, it, it didn't work. And anyway, mm. on the long term, I didn't want to be a singer. I wanted to be a conductor. Mm. So it was a means to an end. It was like a three-stage rocket. You know, I dropped the violin when I became a professional at 28. I, mm. I had this. I could have become. I could have been a back desk violinist in a, in a not, not top orchestra. I had a very good, a very good practical player. Mm. Um, mostly self-taught. <laughs> <laughs> like all the rest of my stuff. Um, but I could have decided, okay, I'll, I'll join an orchestra. I could, I could have auditioned anyway, I might have got thrown out. Um, and it, in, what, in some ways I regretted not doing that because I would have learned more about orchestral culture. Yes. Yeah. Um, professional orchestral culture. I knew a lot about amateur, not a lot. But, um, but I did, I thought that my best, my best earning ca capacity is singing. You can get, you, as a soloist, you get, 10 guineas, wow, you know, yeah. big deal. Um, so, so that was the way to go. Um, and so I dropped the violin at that point. Um, and it's still being played. I gave it to my son and he's lent it to his niece, my granddaughter, um, and she's playing it right now in Cambridge. Oh, great. It's, quite, it's, it's, gone, it's gone back home. Mm. Um, so I dropped that, so the first stage of the rocket, and then the second stage of the rocket, four years later, was was, was the, 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 the violin, the voice. Mm. And then I was on my own. Yeah, um, getting getting small jobs here and there, something in Portugal, something in Italy. So a job, you know, on 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 the day with the RPO in Newcastle, <laughs> uh, one rehearsal in the afternoon, concert in the evening. That's it. A uh, little bit of that. Uh, then, yes, then Kent Opera came along. That, that was a lifesaver, absolutely a lifesaver. Although it began very slowly with only sort of two shows the first year, and maybe four the second year, and maybe six the third year. Then, then the fourth year or so, the Arts Council took us under their wing. I, I, I organized a, a joint meeting with the Arts Council and the fun, a funder and the, the boss, Norman Platt. And we got, we got, a, we got, we got touring, mm. sort of five or six weeks um, in the autumn and five or six weeks in the spring, to small theatres in the south of England, and that was that was fantastic because Norman wanted me to conduct all the shows. Mm. Um, so I did, you know, five shows a week when we were when we were touring, three different operas, um, always always a Mozart, um, and often a, bar a Baroque. And, and usually a, 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 a romantic as well. So a typical week would be, uh, uh, I think we opened Tuesday. Um, uh, we, the first night would be, would be say Traviata. Mm. And then the next day would be Figaro. And the next day would be L'Incoronazione di Popea of Monteverdi. Mm. Three completely different orchestra sizes, completely different styles. Um, but all of which I understood quite well. Mm. Um, and then, and then the, the fourth day would be back to Mozart again, and the fifth day would be back to Traviata. So there was the, 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 the Baroque, the gentle Baroque piece would be in the middle, the other two would be done twice. Mm. Um, and it was, it was very exciting. We had a wonderful orchestra, um, freelance uh, players, very, very well uh, chosen by John Holloway and then later by Colin Kitching. And lovely young, lovely young singers, um, not usually terribly famous, but very, very good actors and singers. Um, 
not, not world not world class voices, but but p- perfect for what we were doing. We used the same people a lot. Mm. There was a sort of company feeling to it all. Um, and and one marvelous thing I did was to get Jonathan Miller involved. So he we did seven operas together with with Jonathan. Um, Norman Platt did others. Um, Nick Heitner did did two. Mm. Um, we, it, we had a very very good proper long rehearsal period. Look good rehearsals on tour. It was very seriously done. Good very good um, music staff. People who mostly went on to Glyndebourne afterwards. Um, very good chorus. Um, uh, again freelance. Um, it was a, it was a it was a marvelous company. It mm. was it did wonderful work, and um, I suppose I did it for about seven seven or eight years. I can't really remember now how long it was. You probably know. Uh, Fifteen, it says on Wikipedia, Roger. So <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I wonder whether by doing a triple bill like that, where you do a romantic, a classical and a Baroque opera, yeah. I mean, was yeah. that where you started really digging and delving into, I hate the term, and maybe you do do historically informed performance. Um, yeah. When did that start for you, you know, prior to you starting the London Classical Plays in 1978? When did you really start digging into this uh, and finding yeah. out more about it? Yes, well, of course, having a Schutz choir started it because, yes. because doing doing music of that period, Monteverdi Schutz, really, we, we didn't know about this music at all. And, and there was there wasn't really a tradition of how to how to perform it. No. We had to, as it were, invent one. Um, we, we sort of knew how how to do Bach, except actually nobody was doing Bach the way they should have done. But but they um uh, but we we kind of knew about Handel and Bach, but we hadn't got a clue about the century earlier, Schutz is almost exactly uh, 100 years before Bach, or exactly, in fact. Mm. Um, and so it was exciting to invent a style and to find that this music, unlike Palestrina and so on, it was what, what uh, Monteverdi called the seconda pratica. It was much more dramatic. It was much more personal. It was, it was in fact, it was Baroque and mm. not Renaissance. And so inventing that style was, was, was exciting. And um, that, so that was the beginning of it. Also, because you then you had to find instruments that would that would work for you. I mean, he he you know he for, for the zinc and the cornet and so on. We began to use those instruments, and that led one forward. And then you and at that very moment, several of the players in in Kent, notably John Holloway, the leader, uh, was getting very interested in in Baroque instruments. And so I began to see. To, to meet these people who wanted to play like that and were beginning to play like that, 1968 or something, mm. 69. Yeah. And in fact, the first original instrument uh, performance or, or rehearsal that I ever had was with five players from Kent uh, in in, Pope- in in Popea for Popea. Mm. Um, so that it, it from from then on, all the all the Baroque stuff we did there was. Was was no vibrato, original instruments, very very original uh, forces. For instance, in Popea, the uh, the Nero had always been sung by a tenor before, but the original was a soprano, mm. and so we had a soprano. There was a, a, that amazing duet at the end, for instance. The, there were two two voices rapping around each other at the, at the same pitch instead of soprano and tenor. So we 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 started to research all that kind of thing, size of performer performance you know the fact that there was no there, there was no orchestra there were just five solo strings in Venetian opera houses um, and no no um, not not no, no organs and so on a lot of lutes and harpsichords but nothing else mm. and and uh, and we thought uh, will, will the audience like this and the answer is they, they absolutely loved it as we, mm. as we toured around um, it was it was the first time one could see that people loved the sound of those instruments and that they would they would go for them. So out of that grew the the London classical players idea of these same these same people. More and more of them wanted to do it. People came to see me with a baroque oboe or a classical oboe and said, "This is what it sounds like. Book me, you know. Book, please book me." And I, a friend of mine is a bassoon player. Book him. Yeah. So, so we started to we had something called the London String Players, and it turned into the London Classical Players, and we did. We just started to do, first of all, Baroque stuff. Um, 
we did a lot of B minor masses and and um, and and things like that sometimes abroad so we, the, we started one day we we, we start we, for the first time we did Haydn, which is incredibly exciting to mm. realize that all that worked for Haydn and then for Mozart. Um, so then we then we called it the London Classical Players properly, and then um, we gradually we started to move forward. You know Handel and Bach, and and then Haydn and then Mozart, and then you know wow, of course we we need to do Beethoven. Yes. We did Beethoven, and um, the rest, as they say, is history. I have a question about that time in, well, in the UK, in London, in... Uh, you know, you, you'd set up the London Classical Players, but around you there was the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment, there was the English Concert, there was the Academy of, of Ancient Music, and I'm sure that some of those players were playing in two, three, or all four, or uh, in doing everything. When you were doing an LCP project, you know, obviously you're the conductor, you're the artistic director, you're the. but how much interplay did you have with the players, other than them saying, you know, I've got a, a Barack Oboe or whatever else, but also style. Was it very much a melting pot of ideas between yourself and the players? How did it work? Because there were so many people who were discovering all of these performance practices during that time, weren't there? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, first of all, of course, one read the literature. Yes. And so that, for instance, I'd, I'd been given a copy of Mozart's father's violin book, you know, which he, yeah. he published the year that, that, that uh, Wolfgang was born. So we know exactly how Mozart was taught the violin, mm. exactly what he thought about, what, what he was taught about speed and phrasing and everything. Um, and I'd had that book since the fifties. Mm. Um, my father gave it to me. He said, oh, you might be interested. And I thought, well, uh, interested to know? In, in something from 1756. Of course I'm not interested, I'm a modern player. And I just put it on a shelf high up, you know, I never, I'd for, almost forgotten about it. Translated by Edith Knocker, I remember. Um, and, but so when this time came that I wanted to know about how to play Haydn, I, I pulled down this, this green volume from the top shelf and I realized it was a gold mine. And mm. I, I, I read it from cover to cover and I, it, it, it changed my life, Governor. <laughs> and then, of course, there were a lot of other sources, Kvantz, Spohr, mm. and so on. For, for each period, we discovered there were, there were marvellous sources. They didn't all agree with each other, but they agreed about the important things, you know. For instance, that Andante is never slow, yeah. um, that Edgar isn't particularly fast unless it says so, and all sorts of things about fermatas and about about phrasing and about good and bad notes and it was it was marvelous and so I remember and I remember when we first did it, the Haydn creation that was just it just amazing it, it, it one changed everything and I remember after that I had to do go back to do I think it was Zauberflöte, at Magic Flute at Kent and um, we finished the Haydn in the summer and um, at some concerts and, and I opened my magic flute, which I'd done several times before, and I, I just read through the score, which was completely different. Mm. It was, I just, and suddenly I knew exactly how to do each, instead of puzzling, you know, when I was younger, I puzzled about Mozart, Tempe, and Hyde, what have we got, you know, no metronome mark, how do we, how do we know? Um, and suddenly it was just clear, I could bing. Just read, read it off. It was like having learned a language, you know, and gone back to the country and you find you can actually speak to people. Um, so that was very, very exciting. And of course that went on gradually through, through from, from into Beethoven, of course, um, where there are metronome marks. Yes. And so there's no excuse for being miles off, off, off key. Um, I remember um, I got my wife to put st stickies over the metronome marks in Beethoven, in the Beethoven symphonies. And I went through writing down what a Haydn player would have thought that Larghetto 3-8 meant. Mm. Second symphony, you know, da -di -da -di. of course he would, he would in 3-8 he knew that was really in one, 
yes. not in school. And, and there's the metronome mark to prove it. And, but I would, I didn't know the metronome mark, I would put down what I thought and, and with each movement of each symphony. And then I would undo the sticky and see how far away I was. Usually I was pretty near. Mm. In other words, they aren't wildly new ideas, Beethoven's markings. They, they're, they're the markings of a, of a late classical uh, composer, which is what Beethoven is. He happened to have strayed into the 19th century, but he was an 18th century composer. So that was, that's the sort of, that's the sort of thing one could do. And, and Beethoven's tempi, you know, they, they revolutionized they revolutionized the way that you heard the music. And it, it was, I've got, and, and, and some of the critics got very, very iffy about it. They're still iffy about some of the second movements, um, even though Beethoven <laughs> proves his point. But, but they, the audience, or the audiences went mad for it. I mean, we yeah. sold 40,000 copies of the Beethoven symphonies in the first three years, you know? I mean, mm. it, was, it was enormously na na a natural, a natural feeling of, of yes, I like it. You know? mm. Well, I think I, th I think if you brought back somebody from let's say the 1930s or 40s, let's say we'd cryogenically frozen somebody, um, and then we brought them back to the present day, you know, we could probably say that there are two major things that that changed Beethoven, you know, for everybody was you know you your recordings with the London classical players of uh, and doing them at the metronome marks. Um, and uh, and also, you know, using original instruments and seating. And the other thing would be, the, you know, the Bayernwright Ur text and Jonathan Delmar going back and changing all the dots to dots and daggers, and also looking at some of the notes and, and also some of the rhythms, for instance, in Beethoven 9. You know, those would be the two major things. You know, you're at the forefront of the one, and then also with Jonathan Delmar and the Bayernwright. Would you say that, you know, if, if we did that, that the person would, would wake up and think, my God, this is a different composer? Well, you'd hope they would. Yeah, you would, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have to mention any names, but there is some extremely well-known people who don't seem to be aware of it at all. They, mm. may, they might use the new edition, but, um, but they simply don't understand about, about the tempo. I mean, mm. e e no, you know, it's, it's quite incredible to me that they don't, I suppose they might believe this funny old canard that, that the, his metronome, Beethoven's metronome must have been faulty. Mm. Why should it have been faulty? It's only a clock. Yes. And he had he had a, one, a brand new one. He knew Meltzer. I mean, mm. and there are lots of metronomes in in old music uh, museums. Whenever I get the whenever I get the chance, I, I, tr I try one of them and check them against my Seiko. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it it they're fine. Of course they're fine. I mean, there's nothing to go wrong. I've got a I've got a grandfather clock in the hall, which is which is um, before Beethoven's death. It doesn't doesn't give me any trouble. No. And, and, and of course he, he could check any time with a clock whether his metronome was working. Mm. So it's, that's just absurd. The, the, why, why people think the metronome was wrong is because the conductors were wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very true. Yeah, they still are I mean, mm. quite, quite often. I mean, but usually nowadays it is much better. I mean, if I, if I see one on YouTube, if one comes up, I have a quick look with the problems I see. Yes, somebody doing a roca. <laughs> One, two, three. I say, yeah, got it, got it. Yeah. So it, it has it has made a huge change. Of course, we had to. We did all our recordings before Jonathan's scores came out. Yes. So, so we had to be fairly knowledgeable about about what what was behind it. I mean, so we knew that the dots were wrong, for instance, instead mm. of the stroke, and all sorts of other things. Um, but but on the whole, we got we got that right. And the metro anyway, the metronome marks were all in. That's it. They were, of course, they were in all the parts, you know, and the old parts, bright coffins, so they were in the triangle part, you know, they were, in, they, were, they were in the tuba part. They were, everybody had them, nobody did them, mm -hmm. except René Leibovitz in the, in the 50s. He, he did a set with pretty good tempi mm. because he was a modern composer. He thought he'd better do what it says. Yes. Everybody else thinks, oh, I know better. I, 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 I think it's, I, I see it as, I've got a vision, you know, I've got a, a vision of the music as it's much slower, more, uh, more, mm. more majestic. You know. <laughs> in, in Germany, they have this word Weierfall, you know, which means full of cons consecration, consecrated. Right. Um, the, it's, it's, got to be, it's got to be consecrated. It's got to be, oh, oh. you've got to be on your knees mm. to play this music. 
And if, you, if you're on your knees, you can't really see around very well. You know, you you <laughs> just you just get on and play the music as if it's as if it's Haydn on speed, and you'll be fine. Yes, indeed. Um, I'm going to go on to sort of your you know pure tone and seating. Yeah. I mean, yeah. a pure tone for me. You know, the, I, when I played as a, whether you you know or not, I played for 22 years in the CBSO, uh -huh. and more yeah. and more often people would come, like yourself, but others would come and ask us to play with no vibrato. I loved it, and and I taught at the Conservatory in Birmingham for 10 years, and I always taught my first years how to play Bach, and I said no vibrato, and preferably try and get hold of a Baroque bow, because it meant that you had to emote from the arm, and... Yeah. The, the, the sort of cover all, you call it the wobbly stuff, you know, the vibrato with your left hand, that thing that covers all mistakes, including intonation, you couldn't use. Therefore, you had to play in tune with yourself and with the instrument, and also you had to learn to emote with the arm. So I loved it. But some players would not love it and would hate it. So were there places, I mean, if I list the places you've been... You know, very quickly been uh, had a job, uh, either a principal conductor or music director, you know, Bormann Sinfonietta, Orchestra of St. Luke's in America, Camerata Salzburg, Stuttgart, Handel and Haydn Society, Boston, Zurich. You know, were there places where you went, or even as a guest, where you encountered more, uh, I don't know, defiance than, than other places? I experienced surprisingly little. Right. But, but that's partly because... For, for several years, I didn't even try. Right, okay. I, mean, I had a lot of guest work in America on, on the strength of the Beethoven symphonies. Everybody wanted to wanted a bit of the action. You know, I got a, there was a, uh, there was a, there was a one week when I was asked out of the blue, you know, by Berlin Philharmonic, New York Philharmonic, and Chicago, if I wow. would come. <laughs> and I turned them all down. Oh, wow. I said, I said no to all of them because I thought, they don't want me. They want. They want. They want the myth. They want something, and I. And I, I'm ready for it, but I don't think they are. I think mm. that I would have just been a battle. So I, I steered clear actually until a few years later, and then I did go yeah. to most of those Berlin Philharmonic quite a lot, and um, and so. But even then, and all all the um, all the, uh, you know, the Boston and San Francisco and. And, and indeed Chicago and so on. Um, I, I did. It didn't even mention the word vibrato. What I did was to to have the um, change the seating. Yes. Which they all they all they were all prepared to do. Um, I mean, some some, of the, some old second violins I remember in Cleveland. No, old second violins say, "Hey, maestro, I remember I remember sitting over here. It yeah. was, I think it was 1936." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and. Um, so that wasn't that wasn't too much of a problem. Um, getting some risers was was quite difficult in America. Everyone played on the flat, right. the prairie right. system. You know, they conductors on a high high uh, rostrum with a with a whip, and the cattle <laughs> all mood in front of him. You know? Yes, yeah. I prefer, I prefer to ideally to stand on the floor and have everybody raised around me, like in like in. Uh, uh, for instance, in Cologne, a wonderful hall for that. Yes. Um, and um, so I didn't mention the word vibrato at all, we, but we did tempo, we did, they, they all thought it was going to be very scholarly, but I would just go in for the, for the jugular vein of the music. Yeah. And, and I got asked back because it was exciting, not because it was scholarly. Mm. And, and so I would, you know, the first program uh, I remember the Vienna Philharmonic, the first program, they asked for Mozart and Haydn and Beethoven, you know, so fine. We did a bit of each. And, but as we walked off stage, they were saying, could you come back in the summer and do Berg and Kodai? Or, I mean, there was a completely different sort of program. Yes. And the same thing happened in Boston. The first program was Beethoven and her. And then and the next one was, can you do Martineau's Second Symphony? In other words, straight away, they regarded me as a conductor, not as a, not as a Baroque conductor, which was yes. very nice. I liked that. Mm. But I had to learn an awful lot of repertory because I didn't have any. I knew an awful lot of shoots. <laughs> 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 50 operas, yeah. but I didn't, I didn't know Schumann's Second Symphony, you know. I remember I did Schumann's Second Symphony for the first time with Boston Symphony. <laughs> so I had to learn very quickly and I had to be, I had to persuade myself that, that I knew the pieces well enough to tell them what to do, and mm. you, know, you know that's that's our job. Yes. Um, you had to know them well enough that you can do that. So, 
So yeah, the, so, so the vibrato thing, I didn't try with a symphony orchestra at all. All the orchestras you've mentioned were ones I was connected closely to, but the guesting, I didn't try it. Right. Only, the only place I tried it was, was with, with chamber orchestras. Yeah. So whenever yeah. I went to a chamber orchestra, I was chief conductor of Bournemouth for three, four years. There I did it. Um, of course, any uh, historic instrument orchestra, Franz Bruggen's orchestra I went to, of course. And others, but then modern ones, Mahler Chamber, uh, yes, Camerata, um, um, Chamber Orchestra of Europe. Yeah. They, they all, they all, they were, they were all fine. I didn't try it at all with the symphony orchestra until I went to Stuttgart. And I'm assuming also, but even when you guessed it, for instance, you know, I don't, I wasn't there the first time you conducted in Birmingham. Um, I wasn't in the orchestra, but I would imagine that somebody at some point early in the rehearsal process said, uh, Roger, would you like us to play with or without vibrato? Was, was that blurring of the lines a regular occurrence? Uh, no, um, oh. I, I don't, I'm at Birmingham actually, I don't know that I ever asked him to play without vibrato. Right. Um, I think I probably didn't. Really, I didn't, I didn't ask a symphony orchestra seriously to do it until the year 2000. Okay. Um, uh, so, I, I don't think it, the only people who the only people who did that was the Swedish radio. And I started by just carrying on, normally expecting them to vibrate, and they did. Yeah. And then after the after about twenty minutes, the leader or somebody else said, um, "Are we allowed to play without vibrato now?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not, that's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> so I, so, so um, I said, "Well, can you?" I said, well, we'd like to, we'd like to try anyway. He said, mm. that we, that's what we were expecting. I said, okay, let's do it. And, and after five minutes, I said, that sounds marvelous, you know, mm. absolutely marvelous. Thank you so much. So we did whatever it was uh, without. And that was the first time that orchestra had actually asked. Mm. Um, normally they, they don't, they don't, they never have otherwise. Um, but as I say, I didn't try until, until, until 2000. And then, then I only went to orchestras that would do it. So yeah. if, a new, if a new one asked, um, I would say, sure, I'd like, happy, happy to come to your wonderful orchestra. Um, I, you realize that if I do, it would mean pure tone, uh, seating, tempo, phrasing, and stuff. Yeah. So ask all your players, every single player, whether they're happy about that or not. Because if they're not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not up for an argument. That's, that's, no. not, that's not my business. Um, I'm there to make music with people who want to do it that way. And so, you know, two or three months later, they would come back and say, yes, everyone's agreed. So, we, so then the, the, the rules were clear, you know? Yeah. And yeah. Even, even, even Leipzig Gewandhaus, you know, they, the first concert, I didn't do any, didn't touch them, but the second concert already, Orm Williams 5 and Brahms 1, um, and I just found a recording of it of a radio the other day. It sounds quite good. Yeah. Um, they, 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 they went, they went, they did, sort of did it. Yeah. They sort of, each each rehearsal, another desk, another desk fell. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> the concert only the back desks were, were still vibrating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it leads. Them, but I but I kept on being asked back, and we did. You know, for, for seven or eight years, I did a, a lot of a lot of stuff with Elgar Wilde and Walton Wilde and all the Vaughan Williams or several Vaughan Williams. Yeah. So it, it was quite quite a happy experience, really. It does lead me on to another question, which is about, well, it's actually, you know, could you give some advice to a young conductor who reads reviews that are less than glowing? You know, because, you know, you, your pure tone is, uh, let's put it um, kindly, it, you're one of the few people who asks for this compared to most people who want vibrato and whatever else. And also seating is becoming much more... Of a, of, a, of a thing now, conductors do ask for the violins to be split and the basses across the back, but various different things. But you would have been criticised in, you know, online reviews or in papers or whatever else. What would you say to a young conductor who wants to go down the road of either pure tone or, or in any other route who could want to be a maverick, you know, like Carensis now? You know, what, what would you say about criticism? Um, did you read the newspapers or the reviews? Only the good ones. <laughs> 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 yeah, I try. I try not to read the bad ones. Yes. It's, it's depressing. It's not so depressing just to be criticised. It's depressing when 
people start from the completely different place. You know, they have yes. absolutely no idea what you're trying to do, mm. even if you've told them in a program note or yeah. something. That 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 is very depressing. I mean, yeah. everybody has a sense of taste, but when their when their taste is 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 governed by completely wrong ideas, like somebody saying that that um, you know the, the Beethoven seven uh, second movement should be slow, you know, when it's actually marked Allegretto, you know, yeah, and, yeah. and, and no mark to make it perfectly clear what the speed is. It's a sort of slow dance. Yeah. It's what the whole what symphony is about dance, isn't it? Yeah. Um, or any of the, or, or, or particularly number four, for instance. Yum, da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum. It's very, it's very witty. It's very funny. There's a big tune with this, with this incessant sort of pub bore. Constantly, going, dum, I'll tell you another one. Ho, 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 ho. And if you go, dum, bom, 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 like, yeah. like forward, forward finger, it's literally half the speed that Beethoven wrote. It becomes a completely different and extremely unfunny piece. Yes. It's extremely, it's extremely witty. It's absolutely delightful. Mm. That's one of the one that one of the worst. Practically, I think I don't know of any recording which goes at the right speed, except for one. I'll, yeah. get, I'll, let you get, I'll let you guess which. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, I mean, I've, I'll have a wild stab in the dark. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when you when you play it at the, at the right speed, and there is a right speed, it isn't a matter of opinion. Yeah. It becomes delightful, and and it only works, you know, at that speed. If you go even a, quite a bit, even a little bit slower, it, it isn't actually hasn't got that wit to it. Dum dum dum, bum bum. Bum, bum. It's too. It's just too slow. It isn't. It isn't anything. It's just. Mm. It's. It's rever. It's reverent. You know. Yes. Reverence is a really a danger in classical music in the classical classical era. You can have reverence in Wagner, okay, could have quite a bit in Brahms, but you don't get reverence in Mozart and Haydn, and not much in Beethoven. Yeah. So it was a long time before I I insisted that that uh, that it had to be like that, and nowadays it, it's it's. Uh, it, it's, it's, been, it's been quite easy. Do you know the story about Carlos Kleiber and that movement? Have you have you heard the story about the Vienna Phil when they were recording it? Uh, when they were recording what? Uh, Beethoven Four, the slow movement. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he he kept saying to them, "No, it's it's all about this lady friend he had called Therese." He said he needs to sound like Therese, 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 <laughs> and. Uh, and the player, I mean, I think in the end he was using it as an excuse to walk out. And eventually he blew his top. He he called the break. They came back after the break and he wasn't there. And he'd gone. He'd, he'd literally disappeared. Well, they had a concert coming up at the end of the week with Beethoven IV. And so they, uh, by pure fortune, Lauren Marzell was nearby and he was free and he accepted the engagement. When it came to the rehearsing the slow movement, he'd obviously been tipped the wink as to what to happen. He stopped the orchestra and said, no, 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 the sound is all wrong. It sounds like you want to play Therese, Therese, Therese. I'd much prefer Marzell, Marzell, Marzell. <laughs> Which I think is a lovely story. I'm not sure who comes out of it the best or worst, but I think it's a wonderful story. Um, but at your temper, there's no way that it could have been Therese or Marzell, so <laughs> it wouldn't have fit in. It's, it's bumptious. It's delightful. Yeah. And I mean... You know, it, 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 it's quite clear what he wants. It's, and he said it was so important to him that the music went at these pieces. So without the metronome, my music has been seriously un, un, misunderstood. Uh, and uh, it, it's gone on being misunderstood. And, it, and he, he said it won't, work at, it won't work at the wrong speeds. He's wrong about that. It works at almost any speed because it's so good uh, that even, even Fort Wengler's speed can, be, can, be, can have its majesty. But I just think it's great to try and do what the composer wanted. I know you teach. Um, what would you think your teaching style could be called? I mean, are you very into gesture and and, te and stick technique, or are you much more into the study of the score and the music? And how do you teach? Well, nowadays I only teach online, mm. so we don't really do any stick at all. Yeah. Um, I mean, tiny little things like. The, the kind of upbeat maybe, but it's all it's all historical. It's all yeah. it's all it's all score score based. Mm. Um, it's all the stuff which which I've made it my business to know about, and a lot of people don't mm. and haven't bothered, and um, and they don't think it's important. So so it, it, there aren't many people who can actually teach this this stuff. 
Mm. Um, and, and those and those who could probably don't or don't want to. But I, I, I'm very happy to do so. And I've been working in, well, just uh, last week, of course, I was in Indiana. Mm. Um, and I'm going to do a lot more there. And then Berlin, two different universities in Berlin, then the Royal College of Music and um, Sibelius Academy in, 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 uh, in Finland. Um, so, and so the answer is I just teach about, you know, Alla Breve and Andante and Allegro and, and not so much about, and then a few tricks, a few tricks about changes of tempo and, and so on, but it's, it, it's historically based, yeah. Mm. But I have uh, done, I have done uh, other, other kinds of, um, of teaching, including in Finland and the Royal College and, uh, and talked about technique. But when I never think of myself as having a, a good technique, it's just useful. Yeah. Um, and um, if people are being clear and useful and, and, and purposeful about the, about the direction. Um, and particularly, I think I want, I want, the, I want the, any gesture they make to be musical, to, be, to, be, to help the music. Um, I remember once working with a very, very good cellist uh, somewhere and, and he, he wanted to be a conductor and he was sort of studying very carefully what I was doing. And after, after, after rehearsals, he said, I, I see what it is you do. You don't make any gesture which isn't about the music. Mm. And I thought, wow, that sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not aware of doing it, but it's just, it doesn't want to just be, obviously it doesn't want to just be in time. I beat the, I, I conduct the music, not the, not the bars. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah. And I, so I encourage that a lot. And I encourage a lot of not using the left hand, for instance. Yeah, I'm yeah. Getting the, that left hand in their pocket. I, I mind about, the, the, I mind about the right hand showing what's what's happening to the music, not not just giving a beat. Yeah. Um, so I often get people to put their left hand in their pocket and make sure they do it uh, the whole movement with one hand. When I um, occasionally see a, a, a video of one of my concerts in, 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 in particularly in Japan, they video a lot there. Yeah. Um, I always look and think with fear and trembling, am I going to see far too much left hand? And yeah. I'm always thrilled when I see my left hand quietly down by, the, down by its side and it only comes out when it's really needed. Yeah. It, it really is, it's really, a, it's, a, it's one of my things. So, I mean, I don't think I'm a, I'm a very good uh, teacher of conducting, but I would like to do, I would, certainly would like to do more now, yeah. now that I'm not active on the stage. Yeah. Well, you've just brought up my final question before asking you about score preparation, which is, uh, uh, it's a two-part question, Roger. I recently watched again, it was a, a tribute to Bernard Heitink when he decided to retire when he was 90. Uh, and at the very end, they asked people at uh, Sir Thomas Allen and a couple of others, what do they think about him retiring? And they said he shouldn't and he should keep going. You've not long ago conducted your final concert and decided to stop. Why and why now? And then the final question is, and what would you advise a young Roger Norrington, if you could sit down with him over a pint, you know, this person who was 28, what would you advise him if you could speak to him? Nice question, yeah. Well, why, uh, why, why, why is, yeah. uh, why retired? Um, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> because I've got lots of little things wrong with me, like my voice, for instance. <laughs> um, um, I have a slight loss of hearing, mm. though, though I, I it doesn't the music's quite loud enough i don't want it any louder um but um and and of course you just get weaker i'm 87 yeah. 88 in a couple of months time um and of course i've had almost two years practice with with covid with with covid yeah. restrictions and so i've got used to i've got used to not not working um people who knew me can't believe that i'm happy to do that because i was so driven mm. you have to be driven when you're when you're as you know when you're self-employed yeah. um, and you you've got to have an you've got to have ambition i had pl plenty of ambition more to do music marvelously than just personal ambition so that's that's also that's why and that's also when when now because i'm, because I'm that age and i must say uh, the last concert was november the 18th and so far I feel extremely happy about it. Somebody rang this morning and said, I know you're retired, but could you, could you come and do a bit of recording for us? <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a plane at midday who could get you up here in time. <laughs> that was this morning, yeah. <laughs> 7.30. And I said, nope. No. 
sorry, I can't. I've got I've got other things to do, yeah. which I have indeed. So, but I mean, I, I'm perfectly happy. I mean, uh, 50 years ago, I'd have jumped to that and said, "Yes, I'll come," and don't bother to pay. You know, it would yeah. have been just fine. I wanted to do it, and so that's that's why. And yeah. um, the second part of the question, um, if I was going to give advice to the young the young fella, I don't think I can think of any thing that would have that would have changed. Mm changed for the better. I mean, it seemed very slow for years. Um, uh, and I didn't really, as it were, break through until I was 50. Mm. Um, 50 was when was when um, we started to record the Beethoven's. I had I'd only made choir records before that, really. Yeah. Um, I didn't know much repertory. Um, so but, but you know, every year from sort of 45 to 50, I would think maybe next year I'll, you know, I'll, I'll be discovered. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and then when I got to the end of that year, I would say, well, thank goodness I, I didn't because I've learned so much this year. Yeah. I, don't, I, I can't imagine. I can't imagine not, not having had this year. And that went on for several years. But when I did get to 50, then I really felt I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Yeah. So when I went to... You know, to to debut with Boston and San Francisco and et cetera, et cetera, and Detroit and what have you, hundreds of orchestras. Um, I just, I just, it just felt, I felt fine. I felt absolutely fine. I, I knew what I was doing. It's a great. So one of the things maybe I should have told the young fellow was take take your time. But the other thing I think I would have said was always be passionate. Yes. If you're passionate about the music, you're passionate about exactly how you want it done exactly why it'll get through mm. that, would, that would be advice i would give at least i'd give to other people mm. but i think i've been incredibly lucky to to do to do all the different things you know small choirs large choirs chamber groups chamber orchestras large orchestras choir and orchestra opera small opera large opera i've, I've done everything i can think of in all sorts of different ways um and and i've you know I'm still an amateur. I still do it because I love it. Mm. Um, and and the the idea of somebody coming really from a, from an amateur background to 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 what they call world class conducting. I suppose if you if you've done twenty six concerts with the Vienna Phil, it's kind of in that area. Absolutely, um, yeah. Berlin and stuff. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's 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 amazing. It's amazing to me. I mean, that that talent. And, and hard work can get you that far. It's mm. it's 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 it astonishes me really. Um, so I don't know what I don't know what other advice to give except follow follow your star. But <laughs> I, I wouldn't make that terrible mistake that people do. If you want anything enough, you can have it. Yeah. It's not true at yeah. all. You've got to have a bit of luck. I didn't have any luck for ages, not ages. And all the time I was doing very well at Kent Opera. No, no one in big houses or, or big orchestras was interested or, or looking. When I broke through with the Beethoven, American orchestras and managers would come to the to dressing room to you, I want to manage you. Um, wh where, where have you been hiding? Why, why haven't you, why, why, why didn't we know about you before? And I would say, because you didn't come and look. I've been yeah. conducting as well as this for the last five years. Who, wh when, did you, when did you take the trouble to come and look for me? Mm. Mm. You went away ashamed <laughs> and, I, and I did not. I didn't. I did not have an American agent. Mm. You know, I just said no, I said no to all to all these guys, and I managed myself mostly. Um, you'll know because you've listened to a few episodes. But the, there's one more question before the ten questions. Um, which is sort of redundant now, because you, in theory, unless you go back on your words, you don't need to do this anymore. But let's say you were asked to prepare a new score tomorrow. Did you have a system? Um, did you write things in? Were you a scribbler of notes, uh, red, blue and black pencils and highlight highlighters? Or were you one of these who committed it all to memory? Learning scores. How did you do it, Roger? Well, both. I mean, I did a lot from memory. All, yeah. all the all the standard repertory, but that doesn't mean you don't prepare it first, of course. No. <laughs> so, um, but starting the, the, the wrong end, I mean, I, I, uh, I do, you know, all the, I, I can't do a Haydn symphony with a score in front of me. It's just too, 
it, it's all, it happens too fast. Mm. You have to know it, what, and it's the same with Mozart, and, and, and so all Beethoven, and con, including concertos. And, um, and all Brahms and Schubert and Schumann and, and um, some Bruckner and some Mahler and well, most, most Tchaikovsky and Borsak. Memory is very important to me. But prepar preparation, you know, I prepare a lot and a great, in great detail. I do a lot of marking of the number of bars in, in, in a phrase. Mm. So every, every four bars, a black line comes down. Every eight bars, every three bars. Um, I find that very, very helpful to see the structure, the metrical structure. Mm. Meter and tempo are very, very important to me. I mean, the uh, rhythm, not just tempo. Um, they're my strongest points, rhythm. Um, and then, of course, I, 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 so I mark up a lot of what I want to hear, especially in a big score, like, like Moller 9 or something. I hear, like, I want, there I want to hear the flute, now I want to hear the clarinet. I'll probably put circles around it all over the place. It's a frightful mess by the end. <laughs> but it shows me at a glance what I want, especially for scores that I'm going to be using using a score four like Mahler 9, I don't do from memory, for instance. Mm. Um, so uh, yeah, I mark a lot, periodicity, dynamics, um, finding little places where the violas are doing something really interesting. Um, it's, it, I have a sort of a bit of a, a reputation for, 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 for you know, we, keep saying we hear things we hadn't heard before. Mm. Um, and that's, I, that's just, I, I just intrigue, intrigued by the, the, the way in which harmonies work. I mean, I'm very untrained harmonically. I couldn't teach grade one harmony. <laughs> um, I, 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 never, I never really, I never, never really understood. Now it can be told mm. that I never really understood how, how it worked. But boy, I understand how it works in in sound. Yes. When I hear it, I know exactly what's happening. I can't. I can't give it a name. You know dominant minor ninth or something. I, I haven't got any idea what they're called, but I can hear it very, very clearly. And what and the, at the, that point, it's the second clarinet that wants to be a little bit louder to make that to make that point. Yes. Um, and so I've got a sort of instinctive, childlike uh, view of, of of harmony. Well, and, and maybe and rhythm as well. I think, in a way, coming from the amateur tradition, you know, you, 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 I at least. Um, I, it, it, a lot, a lot of it's just instinct. Mm. It's, it's instinct. It's, it's, it's raw talent. You know, it's just you either you can't take any credit for talent. You, you either have it or you don't. Mm. Um, and and if you do, well, make make use of it. But it's it's a it's a it's a strange it's a strange thing. And that for years I didn't work for memory at all, years and years. And then I started getting really interested in in, in memory. And you go back to being to, to hearing the music. Like a child, yes. Child, like it's childlike. It's important, you know. When you when you heard a score for the first time as a child, you're like, wow, you know. Well, I want that to happen to everybody in the audience, particularly the children or the people who don't know so much about music. I want it to really hit them, mm. and um, that's that sort of amateur tradition has stayed with me all all the way through. And the orchestras that like that, that like like musicality, mm. I get on like a house on fire, you know. Absolutely, you, you, you can eat out of my hand. The ones that are, it's come to work in a tie, and you know, <laughs> I, I won't mention Cleveland or. Um, <laughs> or yeah, else. yeah, but but it's it's the thing. It's what music is. Music comes from you know. To me, is it's a heart, lung, exactly. stomach. That's where it comes from. You know, I I don't necessarily know the, what the name of that chord is, but I know that how I wanted to sound, and I know how I wanted to speak, and I know that's where. The word love is in the phrase of music you know it's not the word it or of or the you know i want to head to that chord and i know that that chord's exciting and you know does is it any am i any worse a conductor if if i don't know what it's called you know i'm not going there because somebody's told me to or because it, it's a dominant 13th and therefore always isn't that interesting i'm going there because my heart and my you know for want of a better phrase my balls tells me it is sometimes <laughs> it's, it's about yeah love, love is love is important love and drama yeah. Yeah, um, and of course, some people, uh, apropos of memory, some people like to have a ca have a camera camera memory, don't they? Yes, they photographic, a, yeah, photographic memory, and and people think, well, that's fantastic, that's amazing, but actually, it doesn't make you a better conductor. No. It just means you don't have to look at the score so much. 
it's what makes you a good conductor is having a having a strong relationship with the music, and 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 of course in in addition, a relationship that's based on the on the facts of the of the piece. It's based on the evidence of the of the times, of the evidence of what Brahms wanted, the yeah. evidence of what Tchaikovsky wanted. Um, that, enough to notice that in in the pathetique all the places where people tend to go slower he's he's put in a little metronome mark to make sure it's slight actually slightly faster there yeah. mm. um all those sort of hammy hammy things that people do the composers didn't like no great composer ever liked sentimentality including elgar one of the yeah. most incredibly heart on sleeve conductors i mean listen listen to his his, his ending he just he just finishes um, and and uh, no doubt Tchaikovsky was not, you know, over over excessively um, uh, sentimental. It's mm. Puccini wasn't sentimental. Verdi wasn't sentimental. Beethoven wasn't sentimental. They, it, 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 they have terrific uh, terrific sentiment, but yes. not sentiment, sentimentality, mm. and that's key. And the history really helps to to put that in place, to fix it in place. So uh, yeah. Um, how to prepare a score, yeah. And I, actually, I, I listen a lot too. I mean, mm. when, I'm, when I'm memorizing, I listen to, to, doesn't matter which recording it is really, because I just, it comes out my way and afterwards. But I, 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 I hear, I hear, then I hear, when I'm, when I'm conducting from memory, I hear what's going to come next. It's, it's the clarinet now, and then it's the cellos, mm. and it's going to be all that, all it's going to be all the wind together. And then it's so, I, 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 I listen, I listen a lot. Mm. Um, when I was uh, young, I thought you shouldn't listen. You know, you 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 could have your own ideas, and um, so I I remember when we played the Bartok first quartet at Cambridge, we didn't listen to any recording um, of it. We 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 went on until we learned it, which is mm. jolly hard. But um, nowadays, if I had to do a new piece quickly, of course, you've got this incredible internet possibility. You can. You can quickly have a listen mm. and uh, come out to the next day if you need to. Yeah. Um, but but uh, the, the 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 it's the it's the sound of music nowadays rather than the way it's written. Mm. Just as yeah. we thought early music was about instruments, uh, we thought historical performance was about instruments. But it's it's not. It's it's about what's in your head, not what's in the instrument. It's mm. about how you how how well informed you are and how you understand what they were trying to do at the time. If you are new to this podcast, you may not know that there is another way you can learn about conductors and conducting by subscribing to my Patreon page. You can hear interviews with musicians, composers, soloists and managers and hear their thoughts on conducting and conductors. You can read my diaries when I guest conduct. You can take part in group meetings with other like-minded fans of this podcast. You can read articles on conducting and conductors and also see videos of the great conductors and you can even have conducting lessons from myself. All of this is available at patreon.com forward slash a mic on the podium and from just £5 a month, which is less than a pint of beer in most cities, you can gain access to this ever-growing resource on conductors and conducting. Details and links to the page are in the show notes attached to this episode. Now... The All Important Ten Questions with my guest, Sir Roger Norrington. Roger, it's that time that in 99 previous episodes has come, which is the Ten Questions at the end. I always start with, what sound or noise do you love and what sound or noise do you hate? Well, I immediately thought of music and uh, sound, one sound that I adore is the Baroque trumpet. Oh, yes. Most amazing sound. Just on, It's just one note played on it. It's... Totally brilliant. Mm. Um, not a not a very original idea. Um, the, the noise that I hate is the orchestra's tuning. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's it's a sort of horrible, cranky, cranky sound. And I always feel that an orchestra, um, when they do it really loudly, you know, and you're standing there, especially with, if you're if it's your debut, they're sort of pouring out this this churning sound. Of, it's like it's like aggression, you know, like. You'll soon be gone. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get we'll get rid of you. you know? I find it, I find it a, a, a terrifying sound. You know, I, I, I hate that's the sound I hate. It's, it's rather it's rather boring. I'm I'm going to be very boring with these questions. I'm afraid. If, 
Roger, that's not it's not a boring answer because it's it's almost the opposite to me. I love the sound of an orchestra tuning because it means I'm about to walk on stage and I won't be in that nervous hell of the pre the five minutes before a concert. It means I'm about 30 seconds away from walking on and therefore the that nervous state will go. But you know, I don't think it's a bad answer at all. I was thinking really more of in rehearsal because on, on yes. you know, the concert they do it with you off stage and you're further away from that. I don't mind it then. So it's, and it's more like a concert and how we get to make music. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but in rehearsal, yeah, you stand there and uh, yeah. Like, yeah, there you are. If you had 24 hours free, what would you spend it doing? I'd go sailing. Oh, lovely answer. Um, yeah, I, I, I adore sailing. I used to have little boats and I've been on some ocean cruising boats as well. Um, sometimes sick and sometimes not. <laughs> but the, the, the business of of hand, handling the wind and the beauty of the, the water and, and the boats, I find that extremely fascinating. I'm too old for it now, unfortunately. And was it a place where you could empty your mind or was it a place where you could actually think about things, you know, coming up musically? How, how did you, how did, how did your, your mind work when you were sailing? Well, when you're helming a boat, you, you, you have to concentrate a lot mm. on it. So no, I didn't think about other things. Um, when I was, uh, when I was, um, somebody else was helming and I was handling the, the, the ropes or whatever, um, or the sheets as we call them, um, then I would sometimes be uh, thinking about music or occasionally I'd have a score and be working on it. I remember one one night working on a score all night by, by moonlight and a lamp crossing the channel in huh. perfect conditions with, with an autopilot on yeah. working. So, yeah, but, but no, you, when, you, when you're really sailing, you have to concentrate all the time. Who would be a favourite conductor or conductors of yesteryear? Yes, um, Giulini. Mm. I was very, very impressed by Giulini. I worked under him quite a bit. Um, he was he was be beautiful to mm. look at and expressive and powerful um, and a good memory. And of course, Carlos Kleiber, I suppose mm. everybody probably likes him. He was my favourite. I never met him. I saw him. I saw him sitting at the back of my, one of my rehearsals at Salzburg. He was, he was remarkably shy. He, he yes. never, never sort of never came forward and said hello, although he did like my work. I happened to know that he had my Beethovens. Um, so he was wonderful because he, he did actually, he did take the metronome quite seriously. I mean, he was the only person who did Traviata following Verdi's own metronome marks that made it work wonderfully. Mm. Quite a lot of his Beethoven is pretty is pretty close mm. to, to, the, to the metronome, um, but he was yes he was elegant. I saw Otello at Covent Garden and something else he was doing. Oh, Bohème, mm. uh, absolutely absolutely marvelous, fantastic. So yeah, he he he, insp he inspired me. The, those two were the were the with people of yesteryear, I would say. Now the the question that some conductors over the previous 99 episodes of either balk to answering or struggle to answer, but others don't mind it at all. Who would be favourite current conductors? Well, I think most interesting to me is um, François-Xavier Roth yes. in, in, in Cologne. Um, that's partly because he, of course he, he's, he knows about early instruments as well. He's one of the few um, people on the mainstream, hmm. as I was, who, who, who knew about both. Yeah. Um, there were other there were other people like Franz Bruggen who who really was an early music conductor who who strayed into uh -huh. into other other conducting, but but uh, but FX yeah. these effects you know and 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 I were very similar and we we got on very very well we shared many many um, many of the same values um, I I don't the other person who impressed me. Uh, lately, I don't know, it was it's Kirill Petrenko in, in Berlin. Mm. He looks he looks awfully good, yeah, um, and quite interesting for tempo as well. Um, so, but so, uh, but I don't know. I, I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't listen or see an awful lot of music anyway. Mm. Um, especially living in the country um, for the last uh, seven years, well, last twenty five years, we, I, did, we, I didn't go to concerts much. I only went to concerts when I was. You know, in in a in a in a, in a town, yeah. Uh, work working. Oh, I saw the, the concert before before mine. You know, yes, uh, and uh, which is always interesting. 
and mm. and um, I I mean I used to I used to I I can't think of many people I really wanted to wanted to be like you know yeah um, um, in the in the end I didn't even want to be like Colin Davis because he didn't understand at all about early music for instance huh. um, and and I mean I I, I love uh, I love the people with 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 technique you know like like um, Seiji Ozawa. I knew him very well in Boston. We worked, we worked at the same time a lot. Um, or um, it was all his Finnish guys. Oh yes, Pat uh, Salonen and... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Isapeka, I mean, mm. beautiful, beautiful. I, I, I wouldn't mind, I wouldn't mind Isapeka's uh, uh, technique. I think he's a, he's, a, he's a good conductor, but he, I remember him saying, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's all right. Um, People, people want to hear your Beethoven, but only my mum wants to hear my Beethoven. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that was very good. That was delightfully, delightfully honest. Yeah, um, yeah. And somehow, somehow it is actually one of the things, I mean, I mean, ad adverting to what we were saying earlier about, about um, ch child, childlikeness, you know, you, it's very difficult to conduct Haydn and Mozart unless you've got a childlike mind. Mm. You, you've got to be you've got to be the sort of person who can sit down on the floor and talk to your to your child or your grandchild and, and to play with them because mm. the, music, the music's too it's too difficult for clever for clever grown up conductors. Um, you've got it's got to it's got to sound incredibly easy. So it's it, it's a it's a bit it's a bit uh, it's a bit of a problem that. <laughs> Question six, Roger, I'm changing for you because it's episode 100 and you're also the only person I've spoken to who's officially retired. So I can ask question 6B. So question 6A is what is the hardest work you've ever conducted? And question 6B is what is the one work you never conducted in your career but wished you had? So 6A and 6B. Well, 6A, I should think... Um... My answer would be Marla Five. Mm. I think that's the most difficult. I mean, of course, there are lots and lots of very difficult modern pieces, um, but they're, they're mostly they're just it's just technique. Mm. Um, you just have to have the technique to get to, to to get through them to do them be useful. You can't be expressive as well usually with those. Mm. Um, but Marla Five is uh, I'm talking about working from memory as well because it's the hardest piece I've ever done from memory. It's very very demanding. Mm. Um, and so from memory point of view, from emotional point of view, obviously it's extremely, um, extremely wide ranging mm. from, from, from agony at the beginning to, to ecstasy at the end. I mean, the, the last moment he was writing, um, the summer after he, got, he married Alma, mm. and, and she was copying out the parts in the kitchen while he was composing in his hut. I mean, it was, it was it's, it's fantastically um, happy. Mm. Um, it not, a lot of people don't realize that also that in the Adagietto, he quotes Tristan. He quotes the he quotes the the, the gaze motif, mm. uh, and in the last movement he re he re he introduces that gaze motif three times. Mm. As it were, three times as it were, Alma appears to him, mm. and and saves the situation actually in the last moment. So that's tremendously joyful. And the first two movements, of course, agony, and then this extraordinary central um, uh, scherzo. Um, so e emotionally, technically, intellectually, um, it, was, it was, and, and memory-wise, that was probably the, the, the hardest thing I've ever done. Mm. And 6B? As for B, um, mm. probably hundreds of pieces. Uh, let's, let's think about, let's think about Parsifal complete at Bayreuth. That's ah. what I would like with 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 Stuttgart, so that we could have played the whole piece with uh, pure tone. Mm. Um, if if somebody the, the, one of the people who was going to Nikki Wagner who was going to who was one of the contestants for the job, you know that, and she I knew her quite well, and she said, "What what would we start with when 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 I get the if I get the job? You know, what would you like to do first? <laughs> Uh, and I said, well, it's going to be difficult because any orchestra there is made up of players from all over Germany and elsewhere indeed. Mm. And they don't like to rehearse and they don't, certainly don't want to change their whole style overnight. So we'd, we'd have to have just 
one orchestra in for, for my shows, you know. Mm. Um, it, never, it never happened because she didn't get it, her sister or one of those other ladies got it. Mm. Um, but um, so I would, I would love to have, I would love to have, to hear what Wagner heard there because Wagner, there was no, no vibrato in Wagner's orchestra. Um, you know, we know the, 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 the leader he, the, the, the Wagner chose three years, three years before he died and he, he never played with vibrato. Oh. Uh, he led the, led the Vienna Philharmonic as well. So, so it was Rosé, he was called. Um, of course, yes, he was Mahler's leader as well, wasn't he? Yeah. yeah. And so he never, he never allowed vibrato in any orchestra he was playing with. Um, and in, nor in his quartet, where you can hear the quartet playing beautifully, pure tone. So Wagner was perfectly happy with that, and as indeed so was, was Brahms and Tchaikovsky and everybody else. It was, it, that was the sound of the, of the 19th century. Mm. So that would have been, that would, have been, that would be my, that would be my favorite. Somebody, somebody called me up. I might come out of retirement to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, uh, that was going to be question six C once you mentioned it, but um, but you know, you're, <laughs> but, well, there we are. There, there's a message for everybody. Ring up Roger and to ask him to do Parsifal with the Stuttgart. <laughs> Uh, question seven, which you don't, now don't have to think about, but I'll ask it anyway. When travelling abroad to conduct, what item could you not leave home without? Well, it would be something frightfully boring, like my blood pressure pills. Ooh, okay. I can't leave. I can't leave without them. No. Um, I might, or I might disappear from the planet even earlier than I intend. Mm. So, nothing, nothing like, um, nothing like. Uh, a, a, a Twix bar or something like right. that, no, or Marmite, but yeah. no, just blood pressure pills. I'm afraid I'm I'm a very boring person. <laughs> yeah, no yoga mats for you. That was a popular answer early on. Yoga was yoga. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Number eight. Anything you like, real or fantasy. What's the one thing you would have changed about being a conductor? The one thing I would have changed would be having a coach. Mm. I think we're all we all we, we some of us some of us trained to be conductors, others of us just picked it up more or less like I did. But but I I would have enormously sing, singers have coaches, tennis players have coaches, footballers have coaches, golf pros have coaches. However high they go, they, they have coach. Mm. And and I think we all should would, would enormously help to have somebody saying that you know that what you're doing there is not working, try that. Mm. And he'd have to be there a lot, um, or she. And I, that, would have, that would enormously improve most conductors, actually. Mm. And I, I, that's what I most miss not having had. Well, in the, previous, in the previous 99 episodes, only one conductor has mentioned having a coach. Uh, and he did it, you know, he was 35, well into an international career, and that's Daniel Harding. He got Mark Stringer in to, to look, watch him rehearse and, and give him advice, you know. And, yeah. and at the yeah. time, I said exactly the same. Tiger Woods has a coach, uh, you know, great golf, all great golfers, um, you know, people across all sports have coaches. Yeah. Why on earth don't we? And I agree with you. I mean, we're not, you know, we're not so grand that we can't get a bit better. Yeah. And we're, only, we're only there to be useful. Yeah. With it to be useful and to be inspiring. The inspiring bit is easy if you've got it, if you've got it. Yeah. If you haven't it, it'll never happen. But the useful you can constantly improve on. Mm. And I think it would be absolutely marvelous if it was a normal, normal thing to do. I'm not, I'm not just we're not too grand. I know, I know what I'm doing. I usually do it like this. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Mm. It, I tried to be my own coach, uh, especially when it came to opera when I was five nights a week. You know, think. Uh, what didn't work on Monday or Tuesday in Traviata, but when it came to Friday, I had to do it together. Ah, that's going to that's gonna work. That works better now. Mm. This, mm. If that didn't work, then what, let's try this. That, I, was, I was really working on, working on improving how useful I could be mm. all that time. Here, here. Um, number nine, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt or have attempted earlier on in life? I would have I'd like to have been an actor. Oh. I, I, when I was at school, I was very, very keen on acting. I was in every, every play, house play, school play, um, and, uh, and, and, and public speaking and, and, and recitations of great poetry and stuff. I was very, very keen on that, which is, which is of course, great help uh, later as a singer. 
um, and an actor on stage. I mean, when I first uh, did my debut in, 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 in opera, professional opera, I, I was quite a good actor straight away. There was no, no, no asked ask back a lot. No, I've never been to acting school. I just done a lot. So it, it, it's, um, it's, of course, it, it, it also made me very aware as an opera conductor. Um, I think I'm a very natural opera conductor, very dramatic. Um, I, want, I, want, I want dramatic effects. And, and the, the text is very interesting. That's why I studied English literature. Um, there was a, a time when I looked back on, when I was about 30, I thought, uh, I haven't really studied music that carefully, but everything I've done in life, studying history at school, I was a history specialist, then I did English literature, then languages, then business. Mm -hmm. Business is really handy for a conductor. I know a lot of conductors can't, 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 couldn't, couldn't run a piss up in a brewery, <laughs> as they say. Yeah. And and then um, and then having been, uh, having lived lived abroad as a child for a while, and then having been in the forces, I was did national service. Mm. Um, all these all these different uh, parts, uh, being an actor, all all played together. To, to, to help me without, without my knowing. And then, and then of course, learning to sing and learning to play the violin. I had, I had all this inf information, hopeless mm. at the piano, <laughs> um, big, 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 uh, big disadvantage, but I have to get, had to get around that. And of course you can get around it much more easily nowadays because of the recording, because there's mm. so many recordings. I would like to have been an actor, but I'm glad I didn't because it's much more risky even than being a conductor. Mm. Mm. Well, in that regard, you share the same answer as another conducting knight. Sir Mark Elder said exactly the same. He'd have yeah, been an actor. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, from similar experiences he had at school and at, at uh, university. At university, I gave it up completely. Uh. It just stopped. Um, two, years in national, so two years in the Air Force was enough for that, maybe. Yes, and maybe. Yeah. Switched to full-time music at Cambridge instead. But yeah, I mean, I just, I'm just... You know, at, 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 the, at the base, especially now looking back and not, and not looking forward, mm. um, it, I'm just astonished by how lucky I've been to be able to be musicians at a fairly high level. And it's given me so much joy. And I've tried to give other people so much joy. And to have that option to be able to do that is quite, quite extraordinary. And I'm, I'm, when I think what my life would have been like if I hadn't made it as a conductor, it, it, it's pretty scary. Mm. So it's been so wonderful. I've been, had such a wonderful life in that respect. Hard work, pretty tough sometimes, but wonderful. If the world were to end tonight, what would be your choice of final meal and drink? Well, I'd go very, very upmarket there. I would, I would like shepherd's pie. <laughs> Lovely. Oh. In the kitchen, cook, mm. cooked by Kay, my wife. Um, she cooks very, very much more elaborate meals as well, but I just love simple food and a nice bottle or two of, uh, of Bogle Californian red wine. Ooh. And um, just, just some raspberries and cream after that. That's all I would, that's all I ask for. I don't, I don't need anything higher, higher up than that, but it's, it's the best. Well, it is the best. I mean, that's a gorgeous, gorgeous meal as a, you know, a lover of simple British English food. Oh, wonderful. It's been a wonderful way to spend the last uh, hour and a half, Roger, chatting to you. Fascinating, witty. I've had a really, really, really nice time. Thank you for being episode 100. And I hope at some point uh, I can chat to you again in the very near future and maybe buy your bottle of Bogle. Thank you. <laughs> well, thanks very much, Mike. It's been it's been, a, it's been a joy. I don't, I don't feel 100, but I, I probably soon will be. <laughs> this, is a, this is just a rehearsal. <laughs> um, it's, it's, been, it's been a joy. You're a very, very good interviewer. And uh, congratulations on your, on your splendid 100 interviews. All the best. A Mic on the Podium was devised and produced by Michael Seal with music by Ben Dawson. Next time, I chat with a Canadian conductor who grew up in Trinidad and was educated in the United Kingdom. He's held positions in both Germany and France, as well as having a highly successful career as a guest conductor all across the world. 
But until then, bye-bye.